Well, it's good to see you here this morning. It's great to come together for worship, is it not? Today is Super Bowl Sunday, and I noticed a lot of people wearing Eagles stuff, a few Patriots stuff. That looks good. <laughs> As you know, my wife's a diehard Eagles fan, and uh, I, being from Massachusetts, am pretty much the same, uh, although uh, for the Patriots. And uh, no, we don't plan to, to watch the game together. Um, <laughs> In fact, I'm going to try to send her tonight to the Super Bowl party. That's here at church. Try to. You know, it's so bad at our house, we don't even watch the pregame stuff together. I mean, I'm serious. We just can't, I mean, you can't even watch the, the neutral stuff. You know what I mean? Like the, the I mean, there, we haven't even started the game yet. I mean, it's just, it's just really not happening. You know what I mean? It, it's funny. I mean, someone put a beautiful New England Patriots uh, jacket in my office uh, anonymously this week, and uh, it's just beautiful. And it says on there, uh, five-time champion. And someone saw that here this morning and said, oh, look at that. It, it must be a curse, you know, because it's just five and not six for today. So it's a sign. Yesterday evening, my wife and I, we haven't talked about the Super Bowl one word in two weeks. And then last night she says to me, she says, you know, she said, do you want your peas on the side with the turkey? And I said, yes. And so I got my peas in a bowl. She took her peas and poured them on top of the turkey. So she's got green peas on top of the turkey. She says, oh, see that? The eagles are on top. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe that's a sign. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, I, I need a sign here. So I'm taking care. We're taking care of the, I can say this because she's not here today. Um, <laughs> we have our grandkids in town, and one of them's sick, so she had to stay home. She'd love to be here, but she can't be. So, so last night, about 7.30, the doorbell rang. And uh, I thought, is that really the doorbell? I mean, it's pitch black outside, you know. Who's out there at this time of night, you know? And my wife says, I think it's a man standing there. She could see kind of through the side light, you know. And she's like, yeah, I don't know if you want to open the door. So I went over and I, I did. I opened the door, kind of stuck my head out. And I looked, and there's a man, sure enough, standing there. And uh, <laughs> I have the weirdest life. Um, <laughs> this guy's standing there, and he's got a two-foot-high parrot on his shoulder. <laughs> the thing's alive. It's like looking around. And I'm like, can I help you? And he goes, yeah, is this the place for the party? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, look, look, well, this is the opposite of a party. There's no party here, okay? We're just, it's DEFCON 5. We're just keeping it real. And, 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 and so I'm trying to help him, you know, find some place to go. It's like, okay, so do you, do you know the name of the person you're looking for? No. <laughs> he says, I said, oh, my stars. So I tried to help him a little bit, told him it wasn't this neighborhood. So off he went with his parrot. I, I talked to this man. I never even acknowledged the fact the man had a parrot on his shoulder. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, we didn't even say anything about that. Like, oh, man, is that a real bird? I didn't say anything. I was just totally deadpan. Like, oh, yeah, it happens all the time here. <laughs> so I closed the door. Karen says, hey, who was that? Oh, I said, uh, some man with a parrot on his shoulder. She goes, no, I got a text from somebody today that said they were dealing with somebody with a parrot on their shoulder. I said, I don't even want to know, okay? I don't want to know anything more than this. But I said, I do know something. And I said, it was a sign. <laughs> she said, what's the sign? I said, the parrot was blue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Not our text this morning, all right? We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning. And we are looking at a passage of Scripture that deals with the subject of boasting. There is um, some 37 times uh, the one noun is used in the Scripture uh, to talk about boasting. And the Apostle Paul is finding himself uh, really being torn down. And he's being torn down from people who have come to Corinth, not people that were inherently from that church, but they've come to Corinth, and they are tearing down the Apostle Paul. Now, whenever there's gossip or slander that's going on, it is all being done with a central purpose, and that is to pull the other person down so that you can look better. And so you want to commend or exalt yourself, you pull other people down. We have to be very careful with this because our boasting is not something that God takes lightly. So in the Corinthian church, the Apostle Paul is dealing with some difficult issues. 
You know, when it comes to our pride and it comes to boasting, one of the realities is the fact that all of us struggle with our pride. Can I just say that again? All of us struggle with our pride. It would be pointless for me to say, raise your hand if you struggle with your pride. I'll save you the trouble and say, we all struggle with our pride. It's not a question as to whether or not we have a pride problem, but rather do we recognize it and are we in the process of dealing with it? That's really the most important part. You and I, all of us, should be able to agree that we have an issue. It's a struggle with our pride. I look back on my life and I can see decisions that were made that were made because of my pride. Uh, I'm not too happy to be able to say that and uh, I'm I'm discouraged by the reality of that, but it's something that I want to work on. It's very important that we do recognize this. It's enormously important. Well, when it comes to sports, I was thinking I'd show a couple of videos or a video uh, to show some of the athletes that are very, very arrogant. Um, Arrogance goes right along with this, right? Arrogance personified. And here's a little video of some racers. The guy in the red is heavily favored. Notice the hand wave to the crowd. He's got this one beat. Slows down. Now, I have to confess that I would have rather used Deshaun Jackson for the Philadelphia Eagles going to the end zone and getting tackled and losing the ball, but I didn't know Karen wasn't going to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23 says, this is what the Lord says, the wise man must not boast in his wisdom, the strong man must not boast in his strength, the wealthy man must not boast in his wealth, but the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh, showing faithful love, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things. This is the Lord's declaration. This morning, I want you to see, as we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, that the Apostle Paul is truly a man of humility. And the main points here certainly uh, uh, really are derived by the argument that Paul is going to make towards those who have exalted uh, an argument against him. Uh, These people have uh, said certain things about him and they've crafted a huge argument to tear the apostle Paul down. And what we learned two weeks ago when we came together was that there are divine weapons, Paul says, for the pulling down of strongholds and fortresses, and it is this that Paul is doing here. What he is doing is he is presenting the truth so that the people of Corinth would be able to see these false leaders as who they really are, and the truth would expose these false leaders. And so what Paul is going to do is he's going to appeal to the truth. This is how we all must handle those strong fortresses, those strongholds that are exalted against Christ and all that God is doing. This is very important for us to understand. And we have a perfect illustration of this as the Apostle Paul sets forth his argument. Now, what I'm noticing here is when it comes to Paul's boasting, he is boasting not over himself or trying to commend himself. Rather, his boasting is over the gifting of God initially. Notice here in verse 7 where Paul says to them, you are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. Let's pause to pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you that we have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that we can name the name of Christ, that we can come by faith 
and enjoy a relationship with our God that is unsurpassed by anything else in this world. Help us, Father, to have the mind of Jesus Christ as he goes to the cross. Help us, Father, to understand the significance of what Jesus was willing to do to release his grasp on heaven and come to this place and pay the penalty for our sin. May we be humbled by this reality. Help us, Father, to think as we should think of ourselves today, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Paul is going to use this term, boasting, as we pick it up in verse 8. For Paul says, For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame. For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. And he goes on and he says, They say my letters are weighty and strong, but if I came in person, they wouldn't find me that way. Here's the point I want you to consider this morning. It is important that Paul is saying, that if he would boast, he would boast further about the authority which the Lord gave him for building up the Lord's work and the church of Jesus Christ. Paul is looking at his life and he's saying that there is a difference here. Those who would boast about themselves would boast in such a way as so as to bring glory to themselves. What Paul is looking at here is very simple. Paul is saying, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the authority that God has given to me. There is nothing in and of myself that I need to boast of, but rather my boasting is about what he has done. If you take the the scriptures and flip back a few pages to the book of Ephesians, I'd like to show you Ephesians chapter 4. And we're very familiar, I think, with 4 and uh, verse 11 where it says and he gave some apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of christ paul has just gotten through saying uh there in second corinthians that his gifting is for the purpose of building up the body not tearing it down as was the case in these false teachers minds and hearts but what i want you to see in ephesians chapter 4 is in verse 2. I'm going to read verse 1 because it goes together. It says, Therefore I, speaking of Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Did you pick that up? Paul says, I want you to live life that is in a manner that's worthy of the calling that God has placed on all of our lives. And he describes what that calling and the manner that's worth the manner in verse 2 when he says, Live it with all humility and gentleness with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Humility and gentleness has a way of building up the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what the byproduct of humility and gentleness is all about. Paul says we need to live out our Christian life and walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that God has placed on our life. And then we come down the chapter a little further and we find out that, that the callings may be different here and there. There are those who are apostles in the church. There are those who are prophets. There were those who are evangelists or I believe missionaries. And then there are those who are pastor teachers. All of these are unique. These are all callings. We would have to go to other passages of scripture to see how all of us have spiritual giftedness. All of us have a calling. God has something in mind for every single one of his servants. And the way in which we live out our life should always be with gentleness and humility. This is the opposite of these leaders in Corinth, by the way. They weren't gentle. They weren't humble. They were proud-filled, pride-filled individuals. They were exalting and commending themselves and truly trying to tear down everyone else. Paul is saying that's not the consistency of truth. The truth is that if we're going to boast, we need to look to what God has done. This is God's mind. God decided that the apostle Paul was going to be an apostle. Before he was Paul, his name was Saul. I always appreciated that that rhymed when I was a kid. You know what I mean? I always kind of remember that a little better. You know what I mean? It's just great. 
And God called him. God has called us. We have been gifted in different areas. It is not our doing that places us in the place that we're in. It is God's doing. I remember when God tugged at my heart about going into the ministry. You know, I could have said no. I could have said, no, Lord, I'm not interested in that. I'm just thankful my ticket to heaven has been punched. And you know what? God would have said, all right. I'll raise up someone else. There is nothing that I can do or say as a preacher of the gospel that really can be attributed to me. It is all attributed to God. Doing God's will is what we should all be about. And so we convey God's word, we convey it in a particular way. It's certainly not about us as individuals, it's about God and his gifting to us certain abilities to serve him with. That's what this Christian life is about. There is really no leeway for pride among the servants of the Lord. I don't understand why God gives one person one gift and another person another gift. Would you agree with me that that is God's prerogative and that is a part of his sovereign wisdom? And we're fine with that, aren't we? We have to be fine with that. And we need to serve God to the best of our God-given abilities, whatever they may be. But understand this, it's not about us. It's never been about us. And that's what Paul points to. He points to the fact that God is the one who has given me this authority. And so if I was to boast, I would boast in the fact that God is the one who has given this to me. That's a lot of different way of thinking from the world we live in. Would you agree? That's a huge difference. The mindset among most people today in the world, outside of the church, is the fact that, well, I'm I'm great and I'm getting greater. (laughs) I'm trying to do great things. I was able to accomplish this. I was able to accomplish that. My friends, we have not ever accomplished anything that God did not give us the gifts and strength to do. And so if we look to the Lord, we look to him with an air of humility, knowing that it is him that we are following. The second point here is that Paul's boasting was over the work of God. Notice in verse 12, where you see Paul beginning to talk about this uh, here in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, we're not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by themselves, compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. We're not going to boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere, which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. Paul was commissioned by the church to take the gospel out. He takes the gospel out to the Gentile world primarily. Yes, he begins with the Jews. He ends up ministering among the Gentiles. It was all part of God's plan, wasn't it? And he says the region that we're ministering in has reached even Corinth. And so this is why we went to Corinth. These other people had come to Corinth from other areas of the world after Paul had been there and built that church up. They come diving in and try to take control of that church. And Paul is saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. If we're going to boast, we're going to boast about the work of God. We're not going to commend ourselves. There's a little play on words here in the Greek that uh, let me just kind of explain it in non-technical ways terms. In verse 12, he says, we're not bold, or we don't even, we don't even dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of these who commend themselves. Uh, the word there, to, cl- uh, to classify or compare, those are two Greek words, classify and compare. They're almost identical words. There's a prefix on the second one that just changes a little bit. Here's what it does. The first word, classify, means to be judged. We get the the Greek word krino. It's part of that word, which means to judge. But he is saying that our judging takes place within our circle of friends or our circle of of, uh, peers. That's the first one. He says, we're not so so bold, or we don't dare to try to classify uh, who we are based upon comparing ourselves with each other in our little subgroup. You know, it's easy. Get a bunch of friends together, right? And sit down and talk about things and then walk away and feel good about yourself because your friends are worse off than you are. 
I mean, you thought you were messed up, but really, I mean, your friends really don't have it figured out. And, and so you walk away. And this is the idea that Paul is saying. We would never dare to do that. The second word, compare, is that slightly different Greek word. And what that one means is for you to have judgment, but not in your little circle of buddies, but on beyond that, out in a bigger area. So we might compare ourselves with our friends. We might compare ourselves with other people at Faith Community Church. We might compare ourselves with, with a small group. You know, we have our small group, and you know, considering where I'm at, I'm doing better than the rest of the people in my small group. Uh, or you could compare yourself and say, you know, I think I'm doing pretty good among Christians. And this is Paul's play on words. He's saying we don't evaluate how we are doing based upon any of those things. We do not compare ourselves with ourselves because if we do that, and the New American Standard is very gentle on that word when it says he lacks understanding. The King James says he is unwise, and I'll tell you what the word is. It's the word for moron. <laughs> you compare yourselves with yourselves, you are moronic. Okay, that is the dumbest thing because you're not going to be judged at any one point. You're never going to be judged based upon other people. Are we straight on that? You're never going to be judged. You can build yourself up all day long, look around at other Christians and say to yourself, I am really doing some pretty good stuff. I, am, I, I really got my act together. If you compare yourself with others, you're making a huge mistake. You, don't, you lack understanding. You haven't thought it through. Because someday you're going to stand before God, not man. Our goal is not to be manlike. We're already manlike. We already have a sin nature. Oh, don't get me wrong. Paul would say, you can copy me as I'm a copier of Jesus Christ, an imitator. And that's fine. You see someone who's godly and you want to instill certain principles that you see lived out in that person's life. That's wise. But ultimately know this, that our goal is that we are desiring to become more and more like Jesus Christ, not like Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. Different point, isn't it? Paul says it's about the work of God. If there's going to be boasting, we're going to boast in what God is doing because all of these works that we see are the handiwork of God. They're not the handiwork of man. We do so much elevation of individuals, don't we? Our culture is just full of it, and I'm telling you what, the church isn't that far behind. I've been to places where a guy speaks, and he's a you know, big-wig speaker in Christianity, and the church lines up to get them to sign their Bible after the service. I'd love to have a signature in my Bible, but it's got to be the one who wrote it. And I'm not talking about Peter, Paul, or, you know what I'm saying? This is God's word. I could dig that, but I can't dig. Okay, look, look at all these great preachers that I've gotten. Okay, you're missing the point. We elevate so much. Our culture elevates so much. We are just off the hook with this. Kent Hughes, um, uh, he's an expositor. He's a, a professor, and he's written some commentaries, if you're familiar with the name. I heard him speak uh, last weekend uh, when we were at Pastor's Conference. He writes this in his commentary on 2 Corinthians. He said he's flying from Chicago. He flies into L.A., and as they're circling around, he sees the Hollywood sign. And he says, it's unspectacular architecture and its restricted size of Hollywood are remarkable in themselves. He says, it's not much of a place. Second Corinthians, he says, reminds me of Hollywood. How so many there seem to imagine that their town, and by association they themselves, are the center of the universe. Not like unlike Corinth in Paul's day. Consider this, he says, Hollywood's notorious groupthink. Hollywood's creation of its own value system. Hollywood's proliferation of self-congratulating societies such as the Academy of Motion Picture, Arts, and Science, which awards its favorite uh, characters, provided they brook its values. It's a city of perpetual award seminary or ceremonies. C c seriously, they have some blooming awards thing on every night it's, or every week. I mean, it seems like if they get bored like for 20 minutes, 
they got to think up another award ceremony for themselves so they get all dressed up, go out and say stupid things. I mean, it's just really pretty amazing. Country music has more awards. I mean, it's like every two months. Whoa, it's an entertainer of the mm, week. Okay, great. Uh, you know, we could start doing that here at church. We could get a big stuffed chair, put it up here, and we can have the Christian servant of the week. And we could get a big purple velvet and yellow hat, and we could put it on you, and we could just, oh, you're just the greatest thing since sliced bread. But we don't do that. Yeah, Hollywood likes to do that. And the world likes to do that. The world loves to boast. They are commending themselves. And this is what they're doing to the Apostle Paul. They're commending themselves. And Paul's looking at this and he's wondering, wow, uh, this is not what we're doing. We're looking to the Lord and we're saying this is all due to God's working. Notice here in this passage in 2 Corinthians 10 that it comes down where Paul says, that he was working, verse 15, not boasting beyond our measure, that is in other men's labors. They were boasting. They were taking credit for what God was doing in the Corinthian church. And Paul wanted to be very clear that what happened in the Corinthian church was to the honor and glory of God. It was his working, not man's. But it says, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond. Paul's looking beyond this. He's saying, God, may you open the doors. May we be able to reach more people for Jesus Christ. It was the heartbeat of his soul. This is what he is desiring to do. And he goes on and he says, so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond and not boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. Verse 17, but he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. If there's anything to boast about, the word boast could mean to praise. He says, if there's anyone who's praiseworthy, it is not us as human beings. It is God and God alone. If someone comes to Christ, it is not the, the technical way the evangelist spoke to him. It is not the, the, the great logic that was used on the atheist to convince him. It was not any of those things which should warrant praise. It is God alone who has done a mighty work. Amen? Amen. And we need more of God. To, we need not less of God and more of man. We need more of God. We need more of his working. We need more people who recognize it's not about me or, or what I think I'm entitled to. It is all about God and it always has been. Let him who boasts understand this, that our boasting should always be in the Lord. Nothing else comes close to that. Some points for us to stop and consider is that our boasting should never be of ourselves since it's God who has equipped us for a ministry. If you serve the Lord in an aspect of ministry, you can thank your creator. You can thank the one who gifted you for that. Second of all, the one who is to be commended should be commended by the Lord and not by oneself or one circle of friends. Someday it's the realization that we'll stand before the Lord. And that's sobering. Think back in your life. As I mentioned earlier in this message that I've thought about something in my life, a couple of things in my life, that, that really decisions were made that were greatly influenced by my pride. Very sobering. It's very sobering. How does our pride affect us? It affects us in more ways than we care to admit. The third point is that we should see ourselves as blessed to be able to say that we're servants of the Lord and understand that God can raise up another to serve him if we refuse to be his servant. There are many who don't serve the Lord who used to serve the Lord. There are many who stand on the outside now and they look in from the outside. Having been burned, hurt, um, something happened, uh, not, not a, really commended by the world, by the church, uh, not noticed for their service, and so their feelings were hurt, uh, the entitlements were never realized, whatever it may be, there are many people who stand on the sidelines. Like somehow we, we, we think that we're going to hurt somebody by not serving. My friends, we have our thinking reversed. We have to look at our thinking and question our thinking when it comes out in such a manner. 
Because the truth of the matter is, it's a privilege to serve the Lord. And let me just say this, that if you decide to serve the Lord in whatever capacity he brings along for you, you have to understand, you will be hurt, you will not be appreciated, you will not get the entitlements you think that are coming to you until after this world is done. God makes it all right. You can go into it thinking that this is a, a way for you to step into something greater in this life. Or you'll be disappointed without a doubt. This morning, it's important for us to stop and consider. First and foremost, what is my relationship to God like? Have I placed my faith in Jesus Christ? There are people who are so proud that they will never bow the knee. Or should I say, they've yet to bow the knee. They look at their own life and they say to themselves, well, I think I'm good enough to go to heaven. The Bible says the opposite. It clearly states there is none righteous, no, not one. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And my friends, listen, as death has entered this world through one man, that is Adam, it came to all men. We are all guilty sinners in need of redemption. Don't let your pride stand in the way. Don't let it block that decision to place faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. And if you're here this morning and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, don't let, faith, don't let this pride influence the decisions that you make. We all ought to see ourselves as God sees us. The Apostle Paul would write in Romans, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to think. But on the backdrop of that is the fact that every one of us is valuable to God and that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world, every single one of us, because he loves you. He loves you so much, he does not desire for you to perish in your sin. He loves you. You and I need to have a healthy self-image and understand that all boasting should not be in man, but in God and God alone. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness to us. If there's anyone here, Lord, I pray today who does not know you as their Savior, maybe, Father, today it's their pride that is keeping them from making a very, very important decision, a decision that's life and death, a decision to trust Jesus Christ. A decision not to trust in their good works or the things that they might be able to accomplish, but, Father, to open their hands up to you and come with an open heart, seeking salvation. Work in our hearts, I pray, today. And, Father, for each one of us, we recognize, Lord, today that we struggle with our sinful pride. It's an issue, Father, for every single one of us every single day. Help us, Lord, to understand that there's to be no boasting in ourselves. Help us, Father, to see every good gift and every perfect gift that we have ever received has come down from the Father above. And may we be thankful people living in an attitude of true thankfulness. Work in our hearts today, I pray now in Christ's name. Amen.